Checkout Tracking by the NPD Group brings you a receipt collecting system that gathers data anonymously through technology we created, providing your businesses with answers. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is AJ Glasser. I am very much on Jake's lawn. I have with me today four fabulous panelists, all indie developers, so to speak, except for one of them will explain to you why he's not. But if you would each take your turn and introduce yourself and say what game you're currently working on. Hi, my name is uh, Ian Tian. I'm from Spin Punch. Um, we do uh, Facebook online games. Uh, the most current one is Summoner's Gate, which is uh, sort of a casual core um, reverse tower defense with um, lots of, with, 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 with an MMO built inside with lots of maps and, and sort of hardcore elements after the uh, casual ones, so that's what I'm working on. Hello, <coughs> my name is Bobby Voiko. I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO of Maven Hut. We build um, competitive solitaire games. We started on Facebook. We also build for iOS and Android. Uh, one, <coughs> our first title was called Solitaire Arena, and since establishing this panel, we actually sold uh, the game to Rakyu. We keep developing solitaire games and. Basically, this is what we do. Hi, I'm John Radoff. We um, are Disruptor Beam. We run a game called Game of Thrones Ascent. We're working on a game called Star Trek Timelines that we're going to release later this year. Hi, I'm Josh from Eastside Games. Uh, we started on Facebook. We made a game called Pop Farm. Uh, I know lots of you have played it. I could look at the data and I know that. Um, and now we make Kitty Clicker, Idle Pause Kitty Clicker for Google Play soon for iOS because it's a national transition, natural transition to go from virtual marijuana to petting cats. And who doesn't love a good pun? All right, so we all know that we're here to talk about how do you build an audience on an indie budget. Indies are not exactly known for being, you know, for rolling in cash, although some of you look like you're doing fairly well for yourselves. So start off with the first question, how do you build an audience on an indie budget? Hold on a second, what does indie mean, please? Oh, you want to start with that one, all yeah, right. Yeah, I want to go right there. Okay, so. Some, I've never had this explained to me. I still don't know what that word means. Actually, does anybody in this audience, if I say to you what an indie game developer is, you know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand if you do. How many of you, if I say startup, think that I mean indie, but just use the wrong word? And if I say startup, can you also be an indie? This is where John has an issue. So Disruptor Beam, I thought of as indie in my head, but when I told that to John, hey, do you want to be on my indie panel? He said, I'm not an indie. I well, I said I don't know what indie means. The problem with the word indie is nobody, like indie is a term in which there is no, uh, not only is there not a common definition, people that call themselves indies don't actually share that much in common. So I could take an indie like, um, I don't know, Minecraft. Was that an indie development effort? Yeah, okay. F fits a definition up until Microsoft bought them for billions. Um, the problem is that the marketing challenges that Minecraft had several years in while they were still in indie is not the challenge that a resource constrained environment has in a, in a younger company. And, th and that's where I think using the term indie can be misleading because it makes you think of a wide variety of companies that actually share nothing in common. So why isn't that true also of startups then? There's a sort of intrinsic connection between indie and funding and the lack thereof. And um, did all of you receive, uh, say, like a Series A or a seed round of funding to start your studios? You did? OK. You did? Actually, yeah. OK, everybody did a seed round. So does that mean that you guys are also all startups? Would you identify with that term? Yeah. OK. Um, what do each of you think of when you think of indie? Like, how do you define it? Josh, uh, can you do this? We can do anything we want. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I highly agree with that. Um, I would say, I think th the way that I can explain startups is it's, it's B's, not M's. So if you're a startup, you're going to be, you know, you're, you're thinking about billion dollar opportunities and something that investors can put money in. They're like, okay, well, this is a startup and I'm willing to, you know, come in at this valuation in these terms because this is something that's, it's B's, not M's. Um, and I think Indy, it's a lot more, in my personal view, it's, it's exactly what Josh says. It's like, you can do what you want. Um, and that's, you know, cr you know, I think, you know, with Minecraft, it's not like they had, it's, um, it, it's very authentic and you kind of build from who you are and you kind of put that out there. And the people who invest, they're not really, oh, they're not going to like, oh, I think Minecraft's going to be a billion dollar company and sell to Microsoft. That was never the, like plan A, right? It's like, hey, I'm super passionate about this. I believe in these, these humans. They're making stuff that I really like. 
and you know, for for indie, it's it's not only um, you know venture money and, and financing, but it's also Kickstarter. It's also you know people who who support projects that they really like. So my my, f and then I think with with gaming studios, it's this weird thing because you kind of have the opportunity to be, do, do both. You can both be creative, and you can go for these large opportunities if you sort of do it right. And I think it's one of those rare industries where you can you can be both depending on the day. And that's my personal view. The, the way we see it is that, first of all, our studio, our development studio is in Bucharest. So when we hire people, we tell them that the decision are made here in this office in 15 minutes. So basically, this is our main difference between being an indie and <coughs> a more corporate uh, uh, gaming company. Because in other companies, in bigger companies, being in Bucharest means that the decision will be taken thousands of miles away in offices in London, in uh, the United States, and stuff like that. So this is how we define to our target employees and stuff like that. And it's a good definition for us. So I'm going to respond to the comment uh, that you can do whatever you want. So. Uh, I, I love you guys. I think that's so totally untrue, though. You can't do whatever you want, and actually that is what being a startup company is, that you can't do everything, and you don't do a lot of the things that you'd want because we live in a world of resource constraint. And I think that's sort of the more interesting thing to talk about, is what do you do in the face of re resource constraint in which, in, in, in a market landscape in which you actually can't do everything you want, and a lot of the things that people are capable of doing at scale are not available to you. And for us, that was pursuing a licensing strategy, and we built a, a game company and earned a reputation around first Game of Thrones and now Star Trek, and it was because of the currency that we earned for ourselves in working with these top-tier licenses that we were able to access very large customer bases. And, and that was our response to marketing in an environment where we weren't going to throw $20 million at a product launch like a Zingamite, but we could get the equivalent of 10 or $20 million of marketing because of the organic lift and the love that people have of these licenses when we brought a product to market. So to me, I think when we say we can do whatever we want, eh, not really. I never believe that. Even the biggest companies don't get to do whatever they want. But it's about choosing which constraints you're going to work within and then trying to adapt to that. I would say that it's relevant only because it affects your funding, and funding is really what defines whether or not you succeed here. So in building an audience, can any of you do that for free? Can any of you guys do it for free, even with a licensed IP? So I think just um, just to talk about that that audience point, um, I think so. For us, our very first game was called Mars Frontier, right? And I'll go back to authenticity, which is that you know this is this game baffles us. Like we put it out. So originally we were a game engine company. We did HTML5 game engines, real time strategy, like no one in 2012 had done anything like we did, um, and we were kind of crazy to do it. And we had this game Mars Frontier, which is like a prototype. Right? And we're like, okay, we'll show off our technology with this. And the reason why we did Mars was it was because uh, my co-founder worked for NASA. Um, he, if you ever seen the movie called Roving Mars, uh, it's by IMAX, produced by Frank Marshall, who did Indiana Jones by Disney. And you know, we had this like this little Mars rover all over Mars, and uh, and and he was and he was the guy who did all the the digital effects for it. He started a company doing that. So we're like, okay, well, let's put some of those like you know Mars creatures into our game. So it was it was a real time strategy. With you know Mars terraforming and and just it just sort of caught on, um, and I think you know one of the things about building an audience that we've discovered is that there's a lot of people who sort of follow the trends of like oh, okay well this many people like Modern War this many people like zombies so therefore we'll do like a Modern War zombie game, um, and then what happens is you go in and you're competing against like like 18 other people who had the same idea. There's I, as far as we know there's like no one who's doing a sort of like a scientifically accurate terraforming Mars, you know. Um, game as we did and it just it just got this amazing sort of hardcore audience that put up wikis and you know just started communities around it and uh, and just kind of took off so I think um, you know definitely agree that well I, and, and it's you know similar to what what um, disruptor beam does in sort of addressing the uh, the Game of Thrones audience and the Star Trek audience we just kind of address we got kind of like an unlicensed um, we kind of had this unlicensed game that, that really addressed a niche audience, and you know, there's nothing else out there. So you know, I think that's like one strategy I, I throw out for, for building an audience for not a lot of money, is be original and be authentic. Uh, like we had so many debates. He was like, I'm like, oh yeah, we'll have these dust storms as well. 
and my co-founder's like, oh no, dust is not like the gravity and like dust storms don't happen and here's why. He was so scientifically accurate on that and then our fans just kind of really loved it. Um, so, so I think there's more opportunity than people realize about using your own authenticity to make something that you love and then finding an audience around that that kind of comes for free. So actually, Bobby, I want to ask you then. Um, you make Solitaire, and everybody knows how to play Solitaire pretty much from the time they get their first computer because it's one of the default games that's available. So how did you identify and connect with the audience that you found on Facebook for the Solitaire games? <coughs> we took a more pragmatic uh, path to, to bring in an audience. So basically when we started Solitaire Arena, we recognized that the competitive thing that we, we had, basically you can play Solitaire against somebody else in real time, was something interesting, but at the same time, because it's solitaire, people would think that it's the same game that they knew from Windows 20 years ago. So, <coughs> because we were not drowning in cash or anything, we tried to understand which is the cheapest audience that we can bring to the game. So we took Facebook ads, we went through the entire audience, and we found that at that time in 2012, the cheapest audience we could get was in Latin America, which was pretty much close to the audience we wanted to target, so not Asian markets, which were difficult for us. We didn't understand, we knew there is a culture clash in gaming between the, the two markets. So we used one of the resources we had, which was, I was pretty interested before that in advertising. I advertised with Google and stuff like that. So I went to the forums of affiliates and I understood how to target on Facebook ads and I actually got to, to be able to get users from Latin America for our games with one and two cents on Facebook ads. So really early in the, in the making of the company when we were really cash strapped, we were spending about $500 a month on uh, on users, and that actually brought us about 30,000 users a month, which was enough for us to test our assumptions, to, to basically go through the A-B test really fast and, uh, and grow from there. So what we've done is basically identify where the opportunity was and not necessarily trying to, to address a specific audience. We saw the opportunity there, and because the games were already viral enough, the retention was big, the, the engagement was big, basically it grew from there. So that was it. Okay, so that addresses how you kind of got those first, you said 30,000? I think by, by the time that Facebook noticed that we were growing, we were about 150,000 users in. And the thing is, our target was, because we knew that the gaming industry was a cash-hungry business, our target was that by the end of 2012, when we started the company, to raise a seed round. So this is what we looked for. Once we had the users, once we had the numbers, it was, well, not easy, but easier to get the seed round and then move from there with larger budgets and so on. So Josh and John, what would your advice be to an indie looking to get those first <coughs> 10, or, or startup looking for those first, say, 10 to 30,000 players that are gonna help prove out the KPIs? Uh, start small and do exactly that. So we always better ideas. So go back to the uh, sort of that original thread we had about what is an indie. Uh, don't leave. I'll only be a minute. <laughs> See, now you scared Everyone him. Everyone relax. Uh, and, and that's, you have to be authentic with what you're building. So even if you're building something that a lot of other people are building, think of what like Supercell did for, to farming games, right? Um, they put uh, a fresh spin, an exciting spin. They made it they, they made a really great game. So make sure you're building with your audience from that time. And e even if you only start with 100 fans, you're building with them, you're communicating with them. And I think game development has changed. We used to go launch a game, be super secret about it, and then launch it. And newsflash, no one fucking cares what you're working on. So you might as well just include them in from the start and really work with that fan base and really kind of layer that on. So even with Idle Pause, we started with 100,000. Um, 10,000 people on our various channels and you could buy uh, really cheap ads to even validate your idea and make sure that the fans really feel like they're, they're, they have a say in what you're building because whatever you're launching, 
it's already gonna be someone's idea. We get so many emails every day from our huge fan base that said like, that was my idea. I told you guys to do that a year ago. You totally should have done that. I have more ideas and just give me $5 and I'll give you each idea for that. That was an actual email. Um, and then make sure you're building on all those other channels as well. So um, even if you have a game that only has like uh, 100 people that are playing it and you're in beta, um, start streaming it on Twitch. Get it out on Twitter, get it out on Instagram, um, Facebook, uh, whatever you can, just to like allow your players in so they can kind of feedback. And then a practical uh, thing that we use is email signups. It's amazing, get like a uh, launch rock uh, page or you know, there's a lot of, there's probably a lot of startups here in San Francisco that all have raised a $10 million seed fund to make a landing page startup. <laughs> you can get them for free and just say like, put a unique piece of art on it, even if it's just a sketch or something and say, be first to play our game and you'll get hundreds of people will come out of nowhere and just be, wanna be a part of that. And the only thing you're giving them is exclusive access to, to be the first to play your game. These are gonna be your power users. These are gonna be your fans. These are gonna be the players that might stick with you for five or six years. And, and they're gonna give you honest feedback. They're really interested in what you're building. So um, you, know, you don't just have to pressure your, uh, your friends and your mom to play your game anymore. You can get other people's moms to play your game. Yeah, I think you just heard two different approaches actually to to the pro to solving the problem. On the one hand, there's like the lean startup methodology where you kind of start small, put small number of dollars in, tune to some key metrics, and then you add more dollars as things are working and you improve the product and you have a really tight development cycle. Um, that's an approach to doing game development. Another is this more audience engagement driven approach where rather than shaping it purely on data, and there's nothing wrong with data, I love data, and data is a tool for continuing to improve, but there is the slightly different approach of involving your intended audience earlier in the process and allowing them to actually shape the type of product. I think that's the same kind of mentality that's driving crowdsourcing and popular things that blow up on Kickstarter, because you get this nucleus of a fan base around the product early that are so passionate that they're gonna go and actually, they're gonna be selling it to other people. They're gonna get people to play it. Um, and that's actually pretty similar to the approach we use at Disruptor Beam. Um, but the difference is the particular w way we're going about licensed game development. I think in licensed games, you can narrowly divide it into to two categories. So there's licensed games that where a game company has a type of game that they've already been making for years and they want to repurpose a game system or a game engine to adapt to an IP because they see a decrease in customer acquisition costs for trying something with a familiar name. Um, Are we talking about Kim Kardashian right now? Sure, absolutely. That, well, uh, yeah, that is, a, that is one great example of it. And you can make a lot of money that way. That is, that's one approach to the market. There's another approach to the market which is you kind of try to peel back to the core of what's important in the IP, understand what's authentic about it, what, did the, what does that core fan base really love, and the bet you're making is that if you can appeal to that core fan base, the core fan base is gonna multiply to times 100 people when they go and get all their friends to play it. And that's more the approach we take, so we're at conventions, we're talking to fans, we are showing people early builds, we're involving them in the process, and what that allows us to do is really build in the features and the story and the gameplay that feels like it's a continuation of a, of a world that you're really in love with. So how do you turn your audience, oh, you first. Oh, I want to say something about this. I think this kind of strategy actually works better for mid-core games and core games. I don't think it really works for casual games, which the, the players basically switch in 10 minutes and they're gonna come back, gonna come back at some point. Uh, we don't really think we have uh, such a big kind of fan base that we can address with a solitaire game. So we wanted to do that, and we kind of realized earlier that if we would do that, we'd probably not have enough users to, to test anything. Well, that ties in then, because how do you turn audience into fans? John's lucky because he already had fans before an audience, and um, I think Josh, Ian, and also Bobby, you guys started with an audience, people, casual players, or people who dropped in just because they were curious and gave you their email address because they wanted to be first, but then What's the step between that and then someone who's loyal to you and will play your next five games? Uh, so I'll, I'll probably say this, which is what I wish I heard when like I was, was starting out. 
Um, but actually, no, what happened is when I started out, I just started you know, doing what you guys do and just talking to, just going to these things and watching videos and talking to a lot of people in the industry. And here's what I learned, um, and this is what we do. We have the game on Facebook. We have just the um, same thing here. We go out and we find like a country like Indonesia or Philippines where uh, acquisition is very inexpensive. We we run like really, really inexpensive ads um, and get like a first cohort in. And the game at the, at the beginning is like, it doesn't work, right? Like we watch our funnel very carefully. People are dying in the tutorial, they fall out. Um, and we just, oh, they're dead. Okay, let's fix that. And we just keep, we just keep updating it. And we keep bringing in more traffic and we keep testing and testing and, and getting people through that tutorial. And then, you know, at the end of the tutorial, there's actually not a game there, right? There's like, um, and they're like, okay, we got through the tutorial. Let's build the rest of the game. And we just kind of build it step by step. Now this only works in the early version. Um, but in terms of how do you take that, that first click and then turn them into a fan, um, it's, for us, it's really mathematical, really making sure that you know, all along the way it's really smooth, and then, and then you sort of like, and you sort of got them sort of trained up, and then they're ready to play the game. Now, our games are like, they take like, to even be a player in our games takes 30 days, right? So the er, that, but that early sort of funnel optimization is, is really key. So with a very small budget, with test, and, and the thing is, like when you test in Indonesia or Philippines, it's not like they blog about it to like the world, right? It's it's a pretty, and this is pretty standard in the game industry. A lot of people do this. Is find like certain countries, our chat is um, is geo is, is like geo locked to that, so like they don't. There's global chat and there's chat in a certain country. There's country specific chat, um, so it's a really great test bed, and um, you really smooth out your metrics, and you get people through your funnel, and you get them sort of ready to play the game. And then when you go to you know other countries. Um, what you, when you go to other countries, you can, we can you re reuse those funnels. Now, there's going to be some differences. Um, country by country, some players are more hardcore than others. Um, and also, there's something we call the golden cohort, which is, you know, as, as Josh mentioned, the first players in are the most hardcore, and they're going to have higher tutorial completions. The first player is going to have a higher tutorial completion than your, like, 10,000th player or 100,000th player. Um, so that's how we sort of, that's how we benchmark it. So lock a country, test it get the funnel working, figure out the differences between uh, those conversion rates and like the larger markets. Um, and then you've got, and then you're ready to go. Then you're ready to start with these people that have already been filtered out. They're really hardcore about your game and, and that's where we begin. Does that make sense? It does. So yeah, you know, to riff off that for a moment though, I think one of the most important things regardless of strategy and actually companies big or small is just maintaining agility in your processes. So. Um, if you're not able to change and adapt to the data, whether that data has come from lean startup methodology or you know close community management of your customers, um, you're never going to adapt to change. So I'll, I'll just give you an example of kind of the confluence of data plus <coughs> fan engagement. So are you any? Is anyone a Star Trek fan in this audience? Do, do you, were you at the Star Trek convention that just finished last week? All right, no one was there. There was a there was a Only Las Vegas man. convention, or no one will admit it. It's okay. I, I see you back there with your hands <laughs> like this. Um, so there was twenty thousand people at this convention. They're all hardcore Star Trek fans. They love it, and we used it as an opportunity not so much for marketing but actual uh, user testing with people. So we we conducted several hundred user tests of our new player experience there where we were collecting data but we were also doing observational learning seeing what people were doing and our back home developers were putting in late nights we shipped another build in the middle of the convention redeployed it on all the machines and then we were testing an update and we saw that some of the changes we made were working so i think if we hadn't been able to make that mid convention change to our build we would not have really gotten as much useful data out of the convention as we might have. So I think, I think it's really making sure that you can build rapidly, which by the way is one of the real problems with iOS development, just as an aside, which is it is not an agile process. It's deploying builds to the app store and waiting one or two weeks while they approve it, which means that for us, the way we have countered that is by being multi-platform. So it's useful for us to have builds that we can put on the web or other platforms where we can be changing as quickly as we want to because uh, the scale on iOS is usually better. There's usually more people. This is what we see live with Game of Thrones Ascent. So we'll test on the web, we'll test on Facebook, we'll tw make tweaks, and if they work well, then we propagate them out to iOS because then you know the two weeks doesn't matter. What are the KPIs you guys are looking for in the, the first, say, 30 to 50,000? So you've got your golden cohort and then you've got everybody that comes after that. What do you look for before you know you're ready to go global or you're ready to go after the Series A round? Uh, so I, I just want to answer, uh, I want to add something to those previous questions. 
because my answer is not as smart because I'm not as smart as these guys. But <laughs> what we focus on is just good old fashioned customer support. Uh, so to create fans, you got to just stop being such an introvert and talk to your customers. <laughs> they're right there. They're playing. You got to talk to them. You got to find out what they want. You got to respond to reviews. You got to respond respond to every uh, email. I don't care if you're a startup with three people. That's what the CEO should be doing because they don't do anything else. So they should probably be doing that. And and then as you ramp up, you should be everyone in your team should be obsessed about um, listening to what your players are saying uh, because the truly great companies do that, and you have to figure out how to scale that. And um, and I think that's what indies forget. They always think about being what they want to be. They always think they want to be like a Starbucks, but you don't want to be a Starbucks. You want to be like the hipster coffee place where the guy has like way better mustache and beard than me and he knows how to make the awesomest Americano. You want to be that place. And then if you scale up to be uh, super big, then you're like blue bottle coffee and, and that's great. So I think you really just got to, everyone just can improve that by getting involved no matter what you do into looking to see what your customers are saying about you. I don't think it gets more indie than a coffee analogy. <laughs> so, but you know, so you've got your early stage customer service. How do you know when you're early though at that point? Like it's working with the key performance indicators. <coughs> for us, <coughs> sorry. So for us, it was the focus on basically the fun of the game. So we looked at how how long the the players were staying in the game. So the um, the session length the um, number of sessions they would play every day. So when we get to a point where we think that by putting in the breaks that would later monetize the game would not actually um, ruin the, the experience, then that's where we, when we go global. Uh, so if you want, first is retention, then it's monetization, and then we go global because by the time we go global, we need to spend a lot of money on user acquisition. And if the game doesn't have retention, and if the game doesn't have uh, engagement, and if it doesn't have monetization at a certain level, we would spend money just to spend money because we would not keep the users in the game. And, and you have to be okay with with killing your game too. Like, look at like you know, Supercell is another great example because they just launch all these awesome games in Canada and they never go anywhere else and then they just end up killing them because they just don't hit the metrics. So we have the same sort of metrics for our, our uh, community team that we look at every day. And I think that's important to have those visible metrics, the number of errors, we have those. And then a big factor I think that a lot of indies miss because they're doing a fast follow on the bigger studios, regardless if you're casual or core is, um, don't even worry about monetization until you get a solid base. Like don't even worry about monetizing your game till you get sort of your 10,000 DAUs and then you can figure it. Because if you, if you don't get 10,000 DAUs, uh, the, if, you're, you're, if you can't even uh, get that amount, monetization is the least of your worries. Like your game's not gonna go anywhere. And I see so many indies just, or small studios just obsessed with, okay, we have 1,000 DAUs and we made uh, this amount. So when we have 100,000 DAUs, we'll make this amount. That's totally not the case. So I think a, a big trend going forward that we're doing and what idle games are doing that's really cool is they're actually hiding all of the monetization until the player gets to a certain point because you know that that player <coughs> is just needs to be engaged on learning the game. So say like until they're you know five minutes into the session or whatever that is for that game, then the monetization appears and says um, uh, you could buy and do this. And, uh, uh, and I think that's good for your initial prototype just to make sure that you have your, you know, retention is the top metric and until you have that retention don't even worry about monetization if you have great monetization and 10 percent retention unless you could somehow find millions of free downloads a day um, you should probably start thinking about your next game uh, so just to keep things interesting i'm going to disagree with a couple of things that you just said so um, which, which will prove that indies or startups or whatever the heck we're supposed to be called you better here be writing this down is um is inconsistency so um, I think monetization is super important to think of early on. So retention is important too, but you have to be thinking about both. It's sort of like if someone asks me, like, what's your job as CEO? Is it focusing on short-term, like, tactical results, or is it, like, the strategy, the long-term vision? Yeah, both. You have to do both. So, and when I think about that, you know, 
there, there, there's a relationship. Those are codependent variables, your monetization and your retention. In fact, people will retain better if you were able to convince them to spend money because then they're invested, they'll stick with the game more. Yes, you might be able to retain people and monetize them, but if you aren't thinking about the game mechanics to support monetization early on in your product development, well, you might retain it great, but then end up with a game which only monetizes with advertising or sort of low ARP DAO type results. So, I mean, for me, I think about the business model and the monetization engine within a game very much at the same time as we're thinking about retention. And in some ways, they're the same thing, because we think that if we are retaining well, we're also monetizing well, and it's about having the monetization system that will be compatible with very long-term engagement. Um, yeah, and I forget what the earlier thing you said was, so I can't respond to it. <laughs> I, I, I think that was like a bad disagreement because it was a half agreement, and then it was a very Canadian disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, keep it clean. Go me, on. So I'll, I'll throw one thing out there, which is maybe a different <laughs> perspective. Um, so I guess for us, um, and this this came out of Eric Reese, uh, who made video games before he made um, his his book stuff, which is there's four currencies for our game for core games. There's four currencies. There's the time you spend in the game. There's the level of skill you have. Like these are all ways you can progress. So you spend a lot of time. You have a really high level of skill. You can min-max. You have a lot of like social capital. So you have a lot of friends that cooperate, and those mechanics work. Or you spend money, and only a tiny percentage of people actually spend money. So what we think about is having these four currencies of the game properly balanced, so there aren't any leaks. Um, and if you balance these four, then, you, then what we do is we sort of optimize for time, right? Like, are people sort of retention? Are they retaining? Are they spending time? Are they doing activities? What are they doing? And as, as long as we make it fun then, and have, this, have stable exchange rates, then, then the money kind of comes, right? So um, there's got to be someone, I agree with John, there's got to be someone in the studio thinking about monetization and making sure that exchange rate is there. And then everyone else can focus on making, and as John says, make this a really fun game, really having, have people engaged. And I think as long as you do those those two things, um, like that's how we think about it. And that, sort of, that simplifies. Uh, it makes sense, I think. Um, it's one of those things, though, where you have an indie who's starting out and they've never made a game before, let's say, and they're not working with a licensed IP, so they can't really do any reconnaissance on what the audience is going to be. And they want to know, how much should I be spending to grow my audience? So assume that you've got valid KPIs and like you know that you're retaining and maybe you're even monetizing at that level. I think conventional wisdom says what, 20% of your revenue you're supposed to reinvest into user acquisition? Is that still true? Or well, none of I you don't know th what, why 20%. I mean, I think you, you keep reinvesting in, in user acquisition until the marginal cost of user acquisition exceeds the marginal revenue of, of the new customer. So potentially it could be, depending on your company, it could be 0%, 1%, 20%, 80%. Exactly, so basically you spend as much as possible if you have the money. <laughs> if you have the money. I think the point, though, is I think, though, if your principal strategy as a, as a very small resource-constrained company is user acquisition through paid user acquisition, then that's kind of a recipe for failure because you will never be able to uh, match the, the ability of larger companies to scale and optimize and acquire customers that way. And you're potentially acquiring the wrong customers. You, it could give you all kinds of false positives and false negatives in that process. To me, paid acquisition actually is a really important part of growing any game, but it's the thing you add on top of everything else that's really going right. It's not your go-to-market strategy. I, I actually disagree. In <laughs> because we started and our main strategy is user acquisition and we're not EA, we're not uh, any big company. So the thing is, if you become as big as those big companies, some of the strategies to optimize your user acquisition process aren't available to you. If you're buying $1 million a day in user acquisition, you spend completely differently the money than the guy that spends just $10,000 a day. So basically, there is a, a place there where you can actually fight the bigger companies for the users that they want. Because we're doing solitaire games, we're fighting with companies buying users for um, uh, casino games, and we are actually growing. So we've been growing in 2014, five times 2013, and we're gonna basically double the revenues this year, which is really big. So 
you can fight those companies. If I would have half a million dollars to spend every day now, I probably would have a problem to fight with those companies. Because as you, as you ramp up user acquisition, the channels that you can use are smaller, not necessarily smaller, but are, there is a lower number of channels that you can use. And this is why the bigger companies fight on those channels. I mean, I spend $10,000 a day on a, on a channel that if I would have $50,000 a day, I wouldn't be able to spend those money on that channel. The bigger companies don't fight on that channel. It's too small for them. So you have a space there where you can actually use uh, user acquisition and you can actually do some kind of brokerage if you want. You buy those users that the bigger companies don't want and then sell them through advertising in your game to the same companies and you make money out of this. We, we can do this. Uh, on ads, I'd just like to add that, you know, uh, have fun with them. Like when we started doing ads at first, we were like, uh, well, besides Facebook ads, which are probably the best ads, everyone should use Facebook ads. Thank you. Um, <laughs> like we just made sure that we worked with our community. So we had a really like Ren and Stimpy style, um, you know, with Pop Farm community, having a lot of fun with them, community team really engaging with them. So we just made our ads like as fun as possible. We just made videos we thought were funny and then had a link to play the game. And, and we just said to the creative teams, like, make whatever you want. What would you like to put? Like, don't, you don't have to do a big like play now and copy everyone. Like just make it fun. It's so, like how do you have fun with your game? And then we actually had fans creating fan content. And I always share this with AJ because I want her to like me best out of all the developers. But <laughs> some of our ads. So we actually put out an ad on Facebook. We paid for it. We paid a small amount for it, and then it was shared out four or five hundred times. People were commenting. People were were adding their own like. Uh, photoshopped ads of the ad to it and the ads probably still around today and it so you can get a lot of free viral traffic by creating a really funny engaging ad uh, putting it out and then as it gets shared out commented liked you're not paying for those re-engagements but it's showing up on more and more people's uh, feed and it's showing up now it's going out of the ad algorithm as people share it and it's showing up as like this is content people like. We should show this to more people. And people are like, this is hilarious, and they're showing it around. So Facebook pro tip, treat your ads as content. Do not treat them and as ads. And you could also do that. I mean, there's a, a lot more inferior networks like you know Twitter and, and that oh, that you can use. Oh, you're so sweet. Um, <laughs> and uh, that, that Twitch thing, I, I don't know if it's going to catch on, but the kids seem to like it. He really um, wants me to do, buy him coffee. <laughs> you can do all that same stuff for there. Uh, and then you'll be amazed to see your fans will then do a take on that themselves. And th just make sure you're engaged at that point, then you can share that out for your fans because all your fans want to see is they're creating content for you that's essentially an ad, and then you're sharing out their content to your fan base, and then the cycle completes. And you're getting, you know, for a big company, it's not that big, but for us to get an extra four or 500 installs we get per day from that, and that's, those are the good, players. Those are the players that you pay, uh, what, three to five dollars for um, that are really engaged that want to see that then install it. It's like, I want to install this game versus a, a five cent ad that's like, you know, you know, check this out. Maybe they'll click it on the side. Well, you kind of raise an interesting point, which is also we talked about monetization, but building in the marketing into the game as well. So to the extent that part of your game design is to create stuff that people are going to want to share and want to show to other people. One tried and true method is to be funny and, and that's what I think you're kind of talking about and it seems like a strategic advantage for your product because your audience probably thinks stuff is funny all the time. So um, there's, there's that. I mean, there's also making stuff that's like highly visually engaging. There's stuff that is... Um, you know, thing our hard strategy or tactics where people want to show that they that they reached a certain challenge and and were able to solve it in a way that other people didn't know about. And any time your game has that and makes it something that people really want to share, I think that also creates a real uh, or organic upswell in, in user acquisition. So to kind of sort of bring it on home, we've talked about paid channels. Let's close it down then with the organic channels. So where do you go to connect with your audience? You mentioned Twitch. Um, there's obviously, there are Facebook channels and there's also Congregate, I believe, has some channels as well, but where do you go? 
Facebook. Are any of you brave um, enough to go to Reddit? Yeah. We actually use Facebook a lot. We've been on Reddit. It doesn't really scale. It's very kind of event driven. So you can do an AMA and some number of people will respond at that point in time. But in terms of consistency, I mean, this is this is actually not kissing AG's butt, but I mean, Facebook is right now the best way to engage with big fan populations and, and continue to re-engage them, so, so there's that. I think Twitch is interesting for the right kind of game. I think that all the streaming platforms are geared towards uh, an environment where it's very performance oriented, so it's about showing your real-time prowess in a game, hence Twitch. Um, you know, things that have Twitch as a component of it are gonna do well in streaming, particularly if you've also got the social ecosystem that allows individuals to, to sort of rise up and become like the role models within that community. That's, that's where I think streaming works really well. Yeah, Twitch has been, has been surprisingly huge for us because we make a farming game. So like we make, we make casual games with a core twist. So we, we, our audience is kind of like Basically, I make games for your mom. So any game your mom would make, they play it. So we have to kind of educate an older demographic on how to use new channels. So we, uh, it's, and it's been great because we are, we're able to get new players into Twitch. Um, we're the gateway app for Twitch. So a lot of people are coming in Twitch for the first time, but we're the only game they watch. Like that's, that's their show, they watch it. And once we we're able to educate them and to watch that, then now they're watching other channels as well. So. Um, don't be afraid to try new channels, even if you just have like a casual game, um, because our fans really like that. Oh, they're able to watch us and identify with what we're doing there. And you're, you're able to plant the seed on Twitch to say like, Hey, we're going to be launching this new thing in three days. And they're almost making it like they're timing that. So it's really interesting to see the sort of now that everyone's a gamer, um, of all ages that you're able to see that, that new thing of like people that were never core gamers to, to now be like timing to do an event. Like instead of years ago waiting for a uh, game store to open and you're gonna get some nerd bundle, instead they're like, you know, setting their calendar event to go and buy this new farm bundle that's coming out and they wanna be the first people to get it when we launch at nine or 10 and being engaged. Um, so that's just one example. By next year we'll probably have a whole bunch more, but just by having that channel, we're able to re-engage an extra, you know, that gets 30, 35,000 views. Um, it gets replayed. Most people watch it uh, at least a second time or a portion of it a second time. So that's pretty amazing that for a Facebook game, they're re-watching that. And for our mobile game, we're now just rolling that out to have that a little bit more organically in there as well. Yeah, one thing I'll, I'll add to that is um, if you can create content in your games that aligns with like community discussion, it helps a ton. So for this game called Thunder Run, um, it's, it's very social based. So there's a group called, you can look on Facebook, Thunder Run Looking for Friends. It's created by players. There's like 5,000 people on it. It's like extremely active. Like it's a community that's built around the game. And um, it's a map. So there's like, there's wars that happen. People post, we have this. So we, we, we saw this happening and we add this feature where you can click a like little camera button and take a screenshot of like, you know, an attack, like the attack logs or like, you know, the maps. And that's gets shared constantly. Like every like you just look at it every single day. There's people sharing multiple times about like I like I blew this up. I owned him um, and and it just it just creates this dynamic. So I think when you we call it heat. So you're looking for heat, right? When you see heat that comes from your community, you start building towards that. And um, yeah, so I think that's that's another thing we think about is like serving, serving the community when you see that heat, and then they can kind of um, do that marketing for you. The 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 thing that the guys didn't say is, and probably because we're not necessarily thinking of addressing to a specific community. It's a casual game again. You don't really have a community of solitaire-minded people. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> what we need to do is to use the facilities that the platforms offer to us as well as possible. So we try to understand how to get into the suggestion corner on Facebook as often as possible. We try to understand how to improve conversion on the search results on iOS through uh, screenshots, through videos on the, on the app page and so on and so forth. And um, <coughs> especially in the early stages, I think it's one of the of the things to focus on 
you know, if you, you want to improve the, the organic uh, user base. We also use community pages on Facebook, Facebook pages and so on, but we, we use it mostly for re-engagement because we don't really, we can't really go to a community that already exists with, uh, with the players that we want. So we're in our last five minutes according to the handler of the room, so I want to leave time for a couple of questions. And it looks like we already have two straight off the bat. Uh, hey, so Josh, I have a question about one thing that you said, and John, it actually might be the, the other point that you couldn't remember. You're talking about um, customer service and you know contacting your customer and engaging with your customer and you know listening to your customer. I totally agree that you want to treat your customers like gold, right? I mean, you just w a lot of the success we've seen is because we treated our customers really, really, really well, or at least we th I think we did in the early days. But I think you got to be careful about listening to what they want, yeah. right? And because they'll tell you lots of stuff that they that they want or they think they want, but it, it's not really. It's they're asking for stuff that would be bad for yeah. them even. Yeah, I think th that's an awesome point. Um, that's why I think uh, that when you start out, if you're big or small, the top level CEO or boss or whoever it is has to be involved with communities and has to have those download uh, meetings every week, or uh, just so you can do that because that's a good point because. In the early days when we just had a community manager that was sitting with the dev team, it's constantly derailing on um, when you only have uh, uh, 40 emails in and 10 all say that you should do this one thing because I don't like the balance, but you do have um, you know, uh, 20,000 dailies. Well, you got to make sure you also look at the data. So the community is just one voice in the decision. The data is another cho uh, voice of the, the business is another choice and then you make that decision based on that. The main thing though is make sure you're communicating back to your fans but never tell them on this day yes we'll do that. Like make sure you're, you're working with you whoever's in charge of marketing to make sure you're giving clear and accurate information to your fans. You never want to say like yes for sure we're launching on April the 8th with this new pack because you requested it and then you don't do that. Um, because they're never going to forget that. So make sure you're just clear and honest about what you're doing. Um, do you not find, though, that licenses sometimes also have a downside? Insofar as, and I'm not talking about the fact that you don't own the intellectual property, but the fact is something like Star Trek, for example, um, whilst it comes with a, a built-in audience, it also comes with an excluded built-in audience. There is an awful lot of people out there who will never touch a Star Trek game because it has the word Star Trek on it. Um, do you not feel that that's a disadvantage at times, though? Um, I don't know. I mean, Into Darkness sold half a billion at the box office, so we're not really concerned about it as a market constraint relative to the size. But that did remind me of of, of the thing that uh, that I, the other thing I disagreed with. So that it and and this is where we're different, by the way, which is with licenses. When he says, "Oh, we can just kill it off," we can't really kill it off. We we are not going to be the game company that like made a Star Trek game, and then it's like, eh, that didn't work, next. Um, because we would then gain the reputation of being the ones who take an awesome license, screw it up, throw it away, move on to the next one that we you can screw like, up. So like Activision. We, yeah, so we can't do that. Um, yeah, we don't have the scale of a much larger competitor who can just do opt into that at any given time. So when we make a decision to get behind a game, we're, we're all in on it, we're gonna build it, we're gonna stick it with it and figure out how to make changes and adaptations to make sure that if we didn't get it right the first time, we get it right, I don't know, the second, third, seventh, twelfth time, whatever number of times it takes, uh, because that's what it means to be in the business of creating a game for a fan base that really loves it. Yeah, we ran out of Google. Right, yeah, so uh, like I said, the Michael Eisner thing is happening upstairs um, in about five minutes, ten minutes or so, so I strongly suggest you get up there and we'll see you back here at about 1 p.m. for the next session. <laughs>